From missing persons under strange circumstances to the more bizarre and mysterious cases found throughout the wilderness of California, there seems to be something lurking beyond the fray just out of human perception. And today, we're going to explore several cases that will make you question the very reality we live in. You won't want to miss this one. On November 7, 2008, 23-year-old Christine Walters, who had recently moved to Humboldt County, California, after a strange encounter with some friends, would take part in a ritual tea ceremony and vision quest. The tea in this case was ayahuasca, a traditional Amazonian brew that contains a powerful hallucinogenic drug. Now, following this intense experience, Walters would stay with friends for a few days, appearing to be in a dazed state before wandering off on the 11th. And on that day, she was spotted stumbling down the road looking disheveled and covered in scratches as if she had been wandering through thorns. She would later be found sleeping on the porch of a couple who she didn't know, and after being taken to the hospital, she would only say that she believed she was being stalked by demons. And now, after a brief stay in the hospital, she checked into a hotel and called her parents, rambling about people being out to get her. She then requested that they fax her some important documents, which they did. Now, on the morning of November 14th, Walters left her hotel in her pajamas and slippers, and after stopping at a copy center, she asked about the location of the DMV. Despite it being daytime and the DMV being less than a mile away, Walters never made it there, and she has never been seen again. A private investigator named Thomas Loth described this case as one of the most baffling he had ever encountered, and he noted that the disappearances of women in Humboldt County had led some to speculate about the possibility of a serial killer operating in the area. Christine Walters was one of the five women who mysteriously vanished in Humboldt County, California over a couple of decades. Now, fast forward five years, and in 2013, a 23-year-old by the name of Danielle Bertolini moved to Humboldt County after the tragic death of her child. In early 2014, she simply vanished without a trace after hitching a ride with a local sawmill worker named James Eugene Jones. Now, he claimed to have dropped her off near her home, but she never arrived. And shortly after, it was discovered that Jones had also been living with another missing woman, Sheila Franks, who had vanished just a week earlier. Now, police were fairly suspicious of Jones, as you can imagine, as he was the last person to see both women, but there was no evidence linking him to their disappearances. I know I'm jumping ahead here, so bear with me, but on March 9th, 2015, a human skull was found along the Eel River near Fortuna, California. It was later confirmed to belong to Danielle Bertoloni. More so, Danielle and Sheila are now considered part of the Humboldt County Five. Something about James Jones is that both Danielle and Sheila were last seen with James, and he claimed to have given Danielle a ride on February 9th, 2014, the day she vanished. Sadly, as of 2023, her case remains unsolved, and with 2024 making 10 years since her disappearance. Now, James was actually arrested in 2024 on unrelated charges, but no charges have been filed against him concerning the disappearances. Now, keep in mind that people go disappearing often in this area. In fact, we're going to go back in time just a bit for this next one. And on September 13th, 1993, 20-year-old Jennifer Wilmer left her life in New York City behind to embrace a California hippie lifestyle in Northern California. She had enrolled in the College of Redwoods in Eureka, California, but upon her arrival, she discovered that all the courses were full. Undeterred, she got a part-time job as a waitress and shared a house with some friends in Hawkins Bar, which is a small town in neighboring Trinity County. Now, on this particular day, Wilmer was reportedly going to a local travel agency to retrieve a ticket for a visit to her family in New York. However, she never arrived at the agency, and the ticket went unclaimed. 
That evening, when she did not return home, her friends reported her missing. Witnesses claimed to have seen Wilmer hitchhiking near Willow Creek, which was just 9.5 miles away from her home. This would be the last time anyone saw her. And of course, there were conflicting reports about her whereabouts that day, with some saying that she was on her way to a farm to inquire about work. And regardless, the mystery remains. Wilmer vanished without a trace. However, this year, something happened. In May of 2024, there was a breakthrough in her disappearance. Skeletal remains were discovered in Fieldbrook, California, and subsequently identified. This discovery has potentially shed new light on the case that had remained cold for over three decades. The identification of these remains has led to renewed interest in the investigation. There are indications that a suspect named Fred may have been involved in her disappearance back in 93. But it's important to note that this information is still under investigation and no official charges have been filed as of August of 2024. Now, another young woman would also vanish under equally perplexing circumstances. 16-year-old Karen Mitchell had moved to Eureka, California to live with her aunt and uncle, Bill and Ann Casper, and to attend Humboldt State University. On November 25, 1997, she left her aunt and uncle's shoe store walking along a busy street in broad daylight. She was headed to a community center where she volunteered to help children. Witnesses said they saw her walking down the street, but then she just seemed to vanish into thin air. An intensive search was launched, but no one knew what happened to her. Despite numerous people having seen her that day, no one could provide any clues to her whereabouts. But one promising lead came from a former police officer who recalled seeing a girl matching her description talking to people in a light blue 1977 Ford Granada. However, after investigating pff, like 1,200 vehicles of that make and model, they found no connection at all to her. Fearing that Mitchell had met with foul play or had become prey for a serial killer, Police investigated several suspects over the years. One was Wayne Allen Ford, a truck driver who claimed to have killed four women. Although he was convicted of four murders, there was no evidence linking him to Mitchell's case. Another suspect was Robert Durst, an eccentric millionaire and also suspected serial killer who had been in Eureka at the time. However, there was nothing to connect him either. And to this day, the mysterious vanishing of Karen Mitchell remains unsolved, with no new leads or information for years now. Similarly, Jennifer Williams' case also remains a mystery, adding to the list of strange vanishings in Humboldt County. All in all, by presenting these cases, I want to give nothing but love and respect to the friends and families affected by these stories. In the mid-1960s, there was an alleged sighting by something very strange that was made by a high school teacher. This teacher was out hiking in the range at the Monterey Peninsula when he spotted a tall, dark figure standing on a ridge. However, folks, one of the biggest reasons so many people encounter strange things while camping is because they lack the proper resistance to those things. See, if you just had the proper repellent, these sorts of things you know, Bigfoot, ghosts, lake monsters, well, they just won't bother you. In fact, Scentbird here has a wide range of fragrances that you can use before you walk off into the woods and don't want to run into anything too hairy. My favorite here is this guy, with notes of cedar, oak, lemon, and a bunch of other great stuff, codenamed Bountiful. Bountiful amounts of peace, because you know, nothing will bother you. They even come in these really neat protective cases so you can carry them on the go. You're heading off into the southwestern desert and maybe you don't want to encounter a skinwalker. Bam, you got Versace. Going for a run in the woods and don't want to see Bigfoot? Bam, you got Dove for that. Or maybe, just maybe, you just want a cool relaxing day at the lake and want to ward off merfolk and other slimy critters of the deep? Bam you got Tonstrand 367. 367 is the amount of times it's warded off potential lake monsters. Okay, okay, so maybe they're not designed to ward off supernatural forces, but when was the last time you heard someone with an experience while or after they'd used Scentbird? Exactly, check and mate. 
and they're pretty affordable. I mean, you only pay eight bucks and you get your own fragrance pack sent right to you. Maybe one fragrance isn't keeping away the critters? Well, Scentbird is flexible enough that you can change your fragrance every month. That's pretty cool. And with their convenient packaging and delivery, I don't see why you can't go romping around in the woods with this stuff on. I mean, these fit neatly into your backpack. So if Scentbird is something you want to try, use my code WHAT or the link below and snag 55% off your first purchase. Again, folks, that is code WHAT to snag 55% off your first purchase purchase. You can find the link in the description below. Now, the figures seem to be just standing there, contemplating the scenery. And the teacher called out to this figure, and in that moment, the entity just kind of vanished as if it had never even been there at all. Now, since this sighting, there have been numerous other sightings of these strange entities right up to very recent years. And one particularly creepy encounter was reported by a witness from Moreno Valley, California in 2011. This witness recounted that many years ago, they were driving through a dirt field in Moreno Valley near Alessandro, which is the old east part of the area. They passed by what they believed were old abandoned barns, a place that locals said was haunted. As fate would have it, the witness's car broke down in this field. Of course, it was dusk and they knew they wouldn't make it out before nightfall. So, Instead of risking getting lost or hurt in the dark, they decided to sleep in the car and set out for help in the morning. This was long before the days of cell phones, so help was not readily available. As the witness and their friend were passing the time in the pitch black of night, they began to notice something strange. They started to see these shadows all around them, and they were evenly distributed. These shadows were motionless, but they were of significant size, and based on their distance, the witness estimated that they were at least the size of a small car, like the Volkswagen Bug they were in, and the figures seemed to be hunched over, perhaps even kneeling. Despite getting in and out of the car and walking around the vehicle, they could not explain or discredit what they were seeing. Now, to this day, the witness claims it still racks the brain, and disturbingly, it doesn't end there, folks. In 2015, a long-distance runner from Silmar, California, who went by the name Joey, reported something strange he had seen while training in the mountains. He said that at 2 p.m. he was running in an area that was so remote that no human could actually climb there without specialized gear. As he was running, he looked up and saw a black figure in broad daylight. He described it as being darker than dark, and he said he had never seen anything like it before. Well, a year later, on January 24th, he would see the same figure in the same spot. This witness was hiking up a remote trail on the 33 when he suddenly felt like he was being watched. He looked up and saw a black figure at the top of the mountain. He waved at it and not really expecting it to wave back, it did. The witness, thinking it was just a trick of his mind or perhaps a tree blowing in the wind, took a puff off his cigarette and to his shock, the figure also blew out a plume of smoke. The witness described the figure as flowing or almost floating down the mountain, and he panicked and ran back to his car, injuring his knee in the process. Now, both of these sightings, separated by three years and miles of distance, raise some unsettling questions. What are these figures, and why are they in places that only people with specialized gear could even access? I mean, there seems to be a concentration of these kinds of sightings in and around the area for some reason. In 2013, an Elizabeth Bennett from San Mateo, California, had reported her own strange encounter that she had while driving past the San Luis Obispo Reservoir. She and her friend were making their way back from Los Angeles when they passed this area. And as they were driving, Elizabeth happened to look out at the mountains near the reservoir and noticed something unusual. Now, she would describe it as a really big human figure, but it wasn't a person. This figure had a black cape, kind of like the Grim Reaper, and it was leaning over, holding on to what looked like a staff. Her first thought was that it was some kind of apparition, especially since it was broad daylight. The figure was dark, almost like a shadow, and it reminded her of a raven. Excited and a little bit scared, she turned to her friend who was driving and told her to look over at the mountains. 
And to her surprise, her friend was able to see this figure as well. And so Elizabeth asked her to describe what she was seeing without giving away her own details. And her friend described the figure exactly as Elizabeth had seen it. The friend even became so startled by what she saw that she almost lost control of the car. After they drove away from the area, she begged her friend to turn around and go back. But her friend, who was already tired from that drive, was not willing to do that. She would later refer to these mysterious figures as the Dark Watchers and was convinced that they were real. Now, believe it or not, for centuries there have been reports of strange entities that seem to watch people from a distance. And these accounts date back to the native Chumash tribe of California's central coast and the Channel Islands. They refer to these mysterious beings as the Old Ones. In fact, early Spanish explorers and Mexican ranchers also encountered them. These beings were often spotted on cliffs, observing the early explorers and soldiers, creating a very unsettling atmosphere. These dark watchers have continued to be sighted over the years, leading to numerous literary references and reports. In fact, one notable mention comes from John Steinbeck's 1938 book, The Long Valley. In a short story titled Flight, a character named Pepe describes seeing a dark figure on a ridge, which he quickly looks away from, not wanting to appear curious. The figure vanishes, and Pepe, feeling suspicious, continues to glance at the ridges, aware of the presence of the Dark Watchers who are better left ignored. Another literary reference to the Dark Watchers comes from poet Robinson Jeffers in his poem, Such Counsels You Gave to Me and Other Poems. He describes them as forms that appear human but are certainly not human. They emerge from behind ridges to watch people, but upon closer inspection, one can realize that they are not what they seem. The Dark Watchers are often described as silent, appearing at a distance on ridges, and most sightings occur at dusk or dawn. And these Watchers are known to survey their domain with an unknowable purpose. If one were to try and draw close to them, they would often vanish in the blink of an eye. And these things are said to be very tall, ranging from 7 to 15 feet, and they're typically seen dressed in all black, wearing flowing cloaks and wide-brimmed hats. Many witnesses have also reported that these figures can carry staves or sticks in their hands of some sort. The area in question is also just as interesting. On the coast of California, from Monterey County all the way up to central San Luis Obispo County, this rugged expanse of peaks and wilderness has long been said to be the home of these beings. Now, of course, this is just a taste of everything that encompasses the Dark Watchers because there are so many stories and encounters on it that they could really be their own series. Unfortunately, what these beings really are and their purpose remains unknown. I figured a nice segue from the Dark Watchers would be this next section. On October 5th, 1879, a woman named Sarah Norton was riding in a horse-drawn buggy on her way to a midwife call. Sarah was known to be a skilled midwife, and she was also married to Noah Norton, who was a government agent a museum founder, a California gold rush prospector, and the founder of Nortonville. And as Sarah was making her way to this coal, the horse she was riding on got spooked and bolted. Sarah was thrown from the carriage and she was killed. Although Sarah was not a religious woman and she had specifically expressed her will to never have a funeral, one was arranged for her anyway. Now, this is where things get weird, because according to most accounts, Sarah's death and the coming funeral would be plagued with all sorts of strange phenomena. And it all started when her body was being moved to the nearby church. At the time, an incredibly fierce storm came up out of nowhere, disrupting the procession and causing the planned funeral to be called off. This odd storm that came out of nowhere would pass and the funeral arrangements would be carried out again. But on the day that this was supposed to happen, another violent storm surged up out of nowhere, dashing their plans once again and sending people scattering. When this happened yet again, and the very next day, it was decided to just have Sarah buried unceremoniously in the Rose Hill Cemetery. 
And this was done without incident. Ever since her burial, the ghostly apparition of Sarah has been said to be very active here. She typically appears dressed in flowing white and hovers over the ground surrounded by this strange supernatural glow. In fact, she's even earned the nicknames White Witch, the Glowing Woman, and the Gliding Woman. And she is known to conjure up ferocious winds when she appears. Interestingly, the area has another White Witch. In the 1870s, a woman known only as Mary was apparently a nanny responsible for a number of children. Many of her charges had the habit of falling ill and dying. Now, whether Mary had any hand in this or not, the town certainly thought that she did. And she was labeled as a witch and was subsequently hanged and her home was burned to the ground. Mary's spirit also apparently appears as a woman in white and is said to guard the minds and usher about the souls of children who died in her care. Now, the spirit seems to be a bit aggressive in that she almost seems to willfully try to frighten people away and to discourage anyone from entering the mines. With such a dark history of mining accidents, disease, and death, as well as the defiled and forgotten graves, it should come as no surprise that the Black Diamond Mines and Rose Hill Cemetery have long been considered intensely haunted. The mines, although access in recent times is limited, are known to spew forth anomalous groans, voices, and even screaming. Shadow-like figures are said to roam about, and the sounds of digging and shovels scraping against the earth are also fairly common, despite the fact that the mines have been out of operation for decades. And there's also a spectral horse-drawn carriage said to careen about the area of the Rose Hill Cemetery, along with the floating glowing crosses and a myriad of strange occurrences like apparitions of children and sounds of laughter and disembodied voices and all other sorts of strange stuff. You, you guys are getting the idea here. The mines in the area around them have been a wellspring of such scary stories for years and it shows no signs of stopping. Now, the mines are still open to some degree and ghost walks through the area are common. So if you are ever in the East Bay area of Cali and feel a little brave, maybe you can try and see for yourself if there's anything to them at all. Maybe when you look into the darkness, the white witches will be peering right back. On the evening of January 23rd, 2021, a man was driving southbound on Highway 101 in California. He was just south of Garberville and the Benbow Inn, and the road was making a few turns as the 101 does, and the speed limit had dropped in this area. And as he rounded a sweeping right-hand turn, he noticed something unusual on the side of the road. There were no other vehicles around him, and he was driving at roughly about 45 miles an hour. And as he passed this figure, he had to take a closer look. The figure was lying on the southbound shoulder of the highway on its right side. And he estimated its height to be around seven feet. But from his perspective, he could only see its back. And he noticed it had broad shoulders and a very thick torso. And its shape was somewhat similar to that of a human. But he quickly ruled out the possibility that it was a human or a bear. Now, he could see the muscular features in its glutes and noticed its head was also kind of tapered towards the top and held off the ground. This hair was kind of like a chocolatey brown and it looked very coarse. He even noted that it did not look like bear's fur, that it was more like hair, but in a way that resembled a bear, if that makes sense. Now, after passing, he continued driving for a short distance and it was then he decided he needed to turn around. And when he made it back to that spot, it was gone. It was nowhere to be found. He was an avid hunter and a fisherman who had spent a lot of time in the woods. And of course, like many others who had camped in that area like he did since he was a child and he had never seen anything like that. And so really, he has no explanation for what he had seen. And he hoped that by sharing this kind of experience, he might find others who have had something similar happen to them. However, there have been other experiences and sightings all around this area. Well, actually like all over California, believe it or not. Because on the evening of August 12th, 2022, a couple living in Susanville, California decided to go camping at a site they found on Google Maps. 
Now, they lived in this small town in Lassen County for most of their lives and were very familiar with the area. The campsite they had found, called Old Ferdinier Campsite, was located about 12 miles from their hometown and it was a rundown site with only one camping spot. And like normal, they arrived at the camp around 615, they set up their camp, and this site was located in a thick pine forest and there was a small creek that ran alongside it. And after setting up, the husband started a fire and began cooking some steaks. Their dog, a mastiff mix, was acting normally and was laying in the dirt near the fire. And once it got dark outside, they kept the fire going to ward off any small critters that might be nearby. They could hear the sounds of animals moving around them and assumed it was just the usual wildlife. And then the wife heard what sounded like a teenage boy hooting and hollering from somewhere down below them, possibly near the highway. And she pointed this out to her husband who didn't hear it at first, but then the sound continued and he realized it wasn't human. Now suddenly a terrifying growl or howl erupted from somewhere behind them about 100 yards away. And the husband was so startled that he almost dropped his plate. The sound only lasted for about 10 seconds, but it was enough to freaked both of them out. And then from somewhere up the hill, they heard another faint howl or scream. And at this point, they were both in shock and could only stare at each other in disbelief. They knew that whatever they had just heard was not something they'd ever encountered in the woods. They had heard coyotes and wolves and foxes and bears in the past, but this was different. It was as if this thing was communicating with others and Kind of like the way coyotes do, where they call and they howl, but it's not the same. Now, their dog, who was normally very active, refused to get out of the car. And so they quickly packed up their belongings and they made their way down the mountain. All the while, it was completely dark out. They have not returned to that campsite since that night. And the wife even admitted that she hasn't even gone out into the woods since then. Because the sounds they heard that night still haunt her. They were at the campsite for exactly three hours and 47 minutes. Interestingly, they had explored this campsite before, walking all around it, all over it, and had never seen or heard anything out of the ordinary. But on this night, something was definitely off. Now, in that same year, on July 18th, 2022, a man named John and his family set out for a long-awaited camping trip to the North Battle Creek in California. They had made reservations for campsite number 10 at the North Battle Creek Campground, which was located nine miles off Highway 44, just past the sign for Lassen Park. Now, John, who was a 66-year-old man, had been looking forward to this trip for a long time because he and his wife, along with their oldest son, Shane, were eager to enjoy a week of fishing and relaxing. And after a two-hour drive, they arrived at the campground on a Sunday. The weather was much cooler than at home, which was a welcome relief. And they spent the day setting up their camp and preparing their kayaks for fishing. That night, they enjoyed a delicious dinner. They went to bed early. And the following morning, John woke up at 4.30 and headed down to the lake in his kayak. He was the only one on the lake that morning and managed to catch his limit of trout. And so when he returned to the campsite, he found that his wife and Shane were awake and they discussed the strange sounds that they had heard the night before. John had heard a loud yell or howl, but he couldn't identify it. His wife and his son suggested it might have just been a large black cow, which they had seen earlier. Now, that night, the other campers at the site nearby made a lot of noise, which prompted them to leave in the early hours of the morning. And so John, his wife, and his son speculated about what could have caused the other campers to leave so suddenly, but they couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation. Well, on July 21st, John woke up at 4.30 and again went fishing. He returned to the campsite around 8 and had a cup of coffee with his wife. When Shane gets up, he had a strange look on his face, as if he was searching for something. Now, after Shane explained what happened the previous night, John and his wife realized that Shane had experienced something unusual. They discussed the possibility of it being a Bigfoot encounter, but they were skeptical. While the following night, John decided to play a prank on Shane by tying fishing line to the back of their tent and running to the trailer door, which was propped open with the stick. 
and later that night, John heard the sound of the stick hitting the door, and he knew that Shane was startled. The next morning, John found the fishing line far from Shane's tent, which made him wonder if it had been a Bigfoot after all. And after returning home, John began researching Bigfoot sounds on YouTube and found a collection of them. He discovered that the seventh sound in the collection was identical to the strange sounds they had heard while camping. Additionally, John's neighbor had also encountered a similar situation while camping at North Battle Creek. Unfortunately, John, his wife, and Shane were left with more questions than answers about their strange camping experience. They couldn't explain the loud howls and the heavy footsteps that Shane had heard outside his tent. All they knew was that something unusual had happened during their trip, and they couldn't help but wonder if it was connected to the legendary creature known as Bigfoot. Yet another story is as equally strange as the few I've already shared. We gotta jump ahead again to the fall. On October 26th, 2022, a woman in her 60s who was an avid equestrian decided to go for a ride in a recreational area called Cronin Ranch in California. The area is located near the American River and is a popular spot for hikers, cyclists, and horseback riders. Now, she typically rides alone, so she's very aware of her surroundings, especially for potential predatory animals or even human threats. But that day, she arrived at the trail around noon, the parking lot was mostly empty, and after a six-mile ride, she reached her favorite spot along the river to let her horses drink some water. And afterward, she decided to take some photos at a picnic area that she had always enjoyed. However, when she got there, she was surprised to find that all of the heavy wooden picnic tables had been removed. She thought it was strange, but didn't dwell on it. While she was standing there, she noticed some movement down by the river. So she turned her head and saw a dark, reddish-brown figure darting into the bushes. Now, she only caught a glimpse of its backside as it ran away, and her first thought was that it might be a person who was skinny dipping and trying to hide from her. But then she remembered that it was too cold for someone to be in the water without clothing, and she began to think it, maybe it could be a bear. Now, in the few seconds that this was happening, she saw a small group of trees begin to shake violently. And the shaking was so intense that the branches were moving four feet back and forth. And she was in shock and decided to ride up to the trail to get a better look. I mean, the area was open enough that if it were a bear, she wouldn't have seen it, but she didn't. And feeling completely mystified, she decided to leave the area and come back the next day. When she returned, she found a sandy area near where she had seen the figure and discovered a footprint with very distinct toes. At first, she thought it might be human, but when she examined it closely, she realized it was much larger than her size 9 boot. Now, as this was going through her mind, she didn't know how to process it. She took a picture of the print, but it didn't do justice to the size of it. When she went to the area where the trees had been shaking, she realized that what she thought was a group of trees was actually just one. The tree had been sheared off of the top due to high water levels during a storm, and the branches that were shaking had been regrown. And so she estimated that whatever had been down by the river had to be at least 8 to 10 feet tall and very strong to have been able to shake the branches so violently. While she didn't see the head of this thing, she remained skeptical and decided to share her story for others to consider. So what do you guys think? Were all these Bigfoot that people witnessed or was this something else entirely? Or were these simply bare misidentifications or are we dealing with flat out liars? I'd love to know what you guys think below. And sadly, the truth behind the identity of all these strange beings spotted will remain a mystery. Now, moving away from hairy creatures that reside in California, there's another mystery that's as equally mysterious. On a warm summer day in 1904, a professor at UC Berkeley named John Fryer was hiking through the hills of the East Bay in California. And that's when he came across a strange stone structure. It was this low wall made of rough stones and it snaked its way for miles to the hills. Fryer had heard of these walls before, but he had never seen one up close. Now, fascinated by them, he began to wonder who had built them and why. 
The East Bay Area, which is located just east of San Francisco, is home to a series of strange walls that have puzzled researchers and locals alike for well over a century. These walls, known as the Berkeley Mystery Walls, stretch over 50 miles through hills, and they meander from Berkeley to San Jose. They pass through various state parks, private ranches, and other areas, and they are a common sight for hikers in the region. The walls themselves are made up of rough stones of varying sizes, with the most being composed of coarse-grained sandstone. The stones range from the size of softballs to massive boulders weighing several tons, and they're stacked together without any mortar, giving them a very ancient appearance. And they are often covered in lichen and overgrown with weeds, and they're sunken deep in the earth. The walls are not built in a straight line either. Instead, they have this kind of sporadic trajectory, sometimes stretching for miles and other times only covering short distances. They can be found in open areas as well as in places that seem inaccessible, leading many to question what was their purpose. One of the most puzzling aspects of these walls is that they do not appear to serve any real purpose. They are not enclosed, making them ineffective for containing livestock. They also do not provide any significant defensive advantage. In fact, some of the walls do end in mysterious stone circles that can be up to 30 feet in diameter, but their purpose remains just as inscrutable as the walls themselves, because Fryer was not the only one to notice the walls. Other early explorers of the region had also reported seeing them, but again, no one knew who had built them, why, or when. In fact, the only information that researchers had was that the walls were already standing when early Spanish explorers arrived in the area. Over the years, many theories have been proposed to explain the origins of the Berkeley Mystery Walls. One of the earliest was put forth by Friar himself, who suggested that they had been built by ancient Chinese or Mongolian explorers, but of course there's no real evidence to support this theory. Other researchers speculate that the walls had been built by Native American tribes or early European explorers and missionaries. Some even suggested that they were constructed by an advanced, lost civilization from the legendary continent of Lemuria which was once thought to be the true origin of the human race. However, there was little evidence to support any of these theories, and in the early 2000s, researchers began to question the long-held belief that the walls were ancient structures, and they noted that the lichen covering the walls suggested that they were actually built between the 1850s and 1880s time when there were many ranchers in the area and there was a steady influx of settlers. And this, of course, led to a new theory that the walls were built to guide cattle, possibly by Native American, Chinese, or Mexican laborers using whatever means they had at their disposal. And of course, while this theory is more plausible than some of the earlier ones, it still does not provide a definitive answer to the mystery. As archaeologist Mark Heikema at the Santa Cruz District of California State Parks said, there is no definitive answer on its origins which further delights the public who can take it to new levels of speculation. Today, these walls remain a complete mystery. They continue to attract the attention of researchers and curious onlookers who are left to wonder who built them and why. Despite the fact that they skirt some of the most rapidly growing and highly populated areas in California, we still do not know the answers to these questions. The walls continue to be an anomaly, a puzzle that remains unsolved. In 1974, a man named Adam Fortunate Eagle Nordwall carved a totem pole and donated it to the city of Livermore, California. At first glance, this might not seem like a big deal, but the story behind this totem pole is one of the most bizarre local legends I've ever come across. Nordwall was born in 1929 on a Chippewa reservation, and he was known for his eccentricity. He was heavily involved in Native American activism and was the president of the Bay Area Council of Native Americans. He had a history of outrageous stunts like infiltrating the Columbus Day play in San Francisco and claiming Italy for Native Americans in front of the Pope. And in 1974, he created the totem pole to commemorate Livermore's centennial anniversary. However, 
He only donated it because the local shopping center who had commissioned him had not paid him. The city accepted the totem, but cut several feet off the bottom before installation, which infuriated Nordwall. He called it a desecration and demanded the city restore it to its original height. They simply refused, and so he threatened to curse the city's sewer system. Now, at first, this seems like a joke, but then Livermore experienced a major sewage backup that cost a lot of money to fix it. The city restored the totem pole to its full height, but they never apologized to Norwal, which meant he never lifted the curse. Now, this led to ongoing sewage problems that seemed to go beyond mere coincidence. In 1974, a time capsule was also buried alongside the totem pole, but when it was dug up in 99, it was found directly under the totem pole, far from its original resting place. Now, although Nordwall denied having anything to do with it, he suggested the curse might be to blame. There were even reports of death associated with the curse. Two city officials who discussed the totem pole curse in a documentary were dead within two weeks. This led Nordwall to lift the curse, although he later denied it. Now, in the years since, he has been evasive about the seriousness of the curse, but he did mention it in his book, Scalping Columbus and Other Damn Indian Stories. He said he doesn't recall lifting the curse and, and expressed his surprise that the legend still lives on 45 years later. On October 3rd, 2015, a witness in Yuba City, California, was photographing a thunderstorm at the Boyd's Pump Boat Launch Facility. After running out of memory space, they went home, got a new SD card, and returned to the same location. While there, they had a strange feeling that they should leave, and it became quite intense. They felt scared, but weren't sure why. After going home, they loaded their photos onto their computer and discovered that two of the photos contain a strange and unexplainable object. This sighting added to the list of triangular UFOs seen in Triangle Alley an area in California known for such sightings. Triangle Alley runs south from Redding through Sacramento to Sonora and possibly all the way to Fresno. The witness reported the sighting to MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, which tracks and investigates UFO sightings. Interestingly, Yuba City has had its share of sightings over the years. On September 27, 2013, a dark, slow-moving UFO with bright lights on either end was tracked by a witness before it suddenly vanished. In December of 2010, a high-speed, cigar-shaped UFO was photographed in the area. And one theory about the frequent UFO sightings in this city involves a B-52 stratofortress that crashed near the area on March 14, 1961. The aircraft was carrying two Mark 39 thermonuclear bombs and while it was destroyed on impact, the bombs were ejected by the crew and disintegrated with no explosion or release of radiation. Now, some speculate that the UFOs could be monitoring the area or they could be the ghost of the B-52. In addition to the sightings in Yuba City, another California city, Sonora, has also reported mysterious loud noises and explosions. Residents of Alhambra, located 300 miles south of Sonora, have reminded the rest of the country that they have been hearing unexplained explosions at a rate of 20 per month since years ago. Sonora residents have reported strange loud noises daily between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. for at least several years now. What's interesting is the booms don't come from the same source. They appear to be coming from all around. However, there are theories emerging to try and explain what these things are, and one theory suggests that the sounds could be coming from the Hawthorne Army Depot in Hawthorne, Nevada, which is about 170 miles from Sonora. A teacher and geologist named Glenn White proposed this theory and even videotaped the detonations at the depot. However, Ken Thomas, a contracting officer for the depot, pointed out that the 170-mile distance from Sonora included a noise-blocking mountain, and he himself only barely heard the detonation from his office, which was 27 miles away. Now, another theory about the booms involves Sonora's proximity to Area 51, which, of course, is a highly classified military facility in Nevada. However, the term 
proximity usually refers to a distance of less than 350 miles, which is the distance from Sonora to Area 51. This means that the distance does not necessarily eliminate UFOs as a cause for the booms. Sonora is also one corner of California's Triangle Alley, an area known for UFO sightings. Now, Glenn White is the only one of the 5,000 residents of Sonora who is investigating the source of these mysterious booms. So this raises questions about the validity of his theory and the overall credibility of the reports of the booms and other sightings in the area. Now, obviously, California is full of a lot more strange things than what I presented to you today, but I hope this gives you a little sliver, a glimpse into the strange and the unknown that exists in our world. We'll have to continue these kinds of things in a future episode. And because you guys made it this far, I want you to comment below, I'm never camping in California. So that way, I know who made it to the end of the episode and who didn't. And if you guys enjoy videos like this where we dive into strange cases of the mysterious and supernatural and just things that are unsolved and weird, then what are you waiting for? Smack that like and subscribe button for content just like this. And as always, never forget, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you all in the very next video. Again, folks, that is code what to snag 55% off your first purchase. You can find the link in the description below.